on November the 15th, 1959, a father, a mother, and their two teenage children were murdered. Who could have any reason to kill them? All the potential leads just did not pan out. When we developed the photographs, we were able to see a boot print that one could not observe with the naked eye. They knew that there was a potential of a second suspect. I came out of prison embittered, ruthless, and emotionally unstable. I'll wait till they catch me, if they do. Hickok investigation took us to Kansas City, where we learned that Hickok had passed a hot check for $192 at Elko Camera Shop back on November 21st. He'd been working at Sands Paint Shop in Olathe, and we interviewed Bob Sands, owner of the paint shop. He told us that Hickok had been working for him, but didn't show up after November 20th. When he'd last seen him, Hickok said, see you in the morning. On the 9th, we put out an arrest warrant for Richard E. Hickok for bad checks. We also obtained a search warrant for the Hickok family farm. The Hickok family, the parents, Walter and Eunice, were very well liked and respected in Edgerton. But pretty early after the Hickoks moved here, people started finding out about Dick. Being a petty thief, being a, a charming con man, Hickok was someone who could fool you into thinking that he was a fine, upstanding citizen, and then when you had your back turned, commit any number of crimes. There was a point when Mr. Hickok, the dad, would give a horse to a family or a store owner, kind of payback for what Dick had took from them. We're sorry our kid stole from you. Have a horse. <laughs> Let's forget that this ever happened. And so that became <laughs> kind of a running gag in town. You knew how much trouble Hickok was in by the number of horses that were on his father's land. The KBI visited Hickok's parents and developed the alleged itinerary of Hickok and Smith that particular weekend. Mrs. Hickok told us that her son Richard and Perry Smith had made a trip to Fort Scott, Kansas on Saturday, November 14th and that they were to locate a sister of Smith's. Mrs. Hickok told us that Richard had not returned home until just before lunch on November 15th. She claimed that she had not seen Richard since that morning. We told Mrs. Hickok that we'd like to search the premises. We found a bloody shirt in the drawer. Then we found something else in the closet. That's where Nye spots the shotgun that Hickok had purchased on credit in Olathe. I think every third Kansan had a 12-gauge shotgun, probably. That wouldn't be surprising. But Nye later said that he actually felt excitement when he picked that shotgun up and really felt they were on the right trail. Outside Kansas City, we interviewed Hickok's second ex-wife, Margaret Edna Sanders. She described Richard Hickok as having a violent temper that was easily aroused. He drinks liquor, usually screwdrivers, and a lot of beer. Smokes Marlboro or Pall Mall cigarettes, likes to dance, and is a lover of music. The next day, we interviewed Dick's first ex-wife, Carol. She said that since he's got out of the penitentiary, Hickok usually called the house at least once a week. The last contact she had with him was on November 19th, two days before he was last spotted in the area. I was born June 6th, 1931 in Kansas City. We're always what you'd call semi-poor. Never down and out, but always on the verge of it. Dad was a hard worker, done his best to provide for us. He was always strict. My mother was always neat, and we had clean clothes aplenty. I thought he was good looking. He didn't look like an ordinary high school guy. He had a way with the ladies, men too, just kind of 
winning them over, getting their friendship, their trust. He excelled at whatever he did, basketball, girlfriends. It wasn't until after the, the, the wreck that he started changing. He was working with me. I run a body and fender shop in Gardner, Kansas for Rourke Motor Company, and he was my helper. The dad sent Dick to Olathe for some car parts. Water on the highway caused him to lose control of his car. He was ejected from the car. He landed face down in this ditch of water, and a passerby that had been behind him stopped and ran over and pulled him out of the ditch. He probably would have drowned. He suffered a dislocated jaw, and, and something happened where, where an eye was askew from the other one. He had serious major head injuries from that car wreck. You look at his eyes, they are not in line. They're like, his personality was a little different. It wasn't the happy-go-lucky guy like he used to be. I was fired and in the condition I was in, couldn't find another job. But I'd met a girl and fallen in love. In July 51, we were married. All hell broke loose from her dad until he learned she was pregnant. But still, he never wished me good luck. Carol married Dick at about 16 years old, and she absolutely adored him. Dick was really good to his wife and especially his little boys. Dick was an excellent father. I loved watching him play with our boys. But he was a womanizer. Although he loved me, he loved any other woman he could. In the early part of 1957, I met this girl by the name of Margaret Sanders at work. To make a long story short, we became real intimate in our relations. He fathered another child with her. At this point in his life, Hickok is pretty destitute and hopeless. He's tried playing the role of father and good husband. He's failed at that. He's with the mistress, and things are looking very bleak. I started drinking real heavy after that and was drunk for almost a month. First time in my life that I'd ever done that. Started neglecting my businesses, spending more money than I was earning, writing bad checks, and in the end, becoming a thief. Hickok had stolen some firearms, and he tried to sell them at a pawn shop in downtown Kansas City. Dick was arrested. He was sentenced to Lansing Penitentiary for five years. It was enough time for him to stew over the fact that he was poor, and he wanted a quick way to get rich, to get the big score. It seemed like for a while time just went pretty slow. Every day, not knowing what was going on, every day, something new you would hear. Was it true? Was it not? That's why you're better if you don't think about it. You couldn't do anything about it until we found out who did it. There was some feeling like, will anybody ever have to pay for this? After we crossed back into the States, we took a bus and hitchhiked to Barstow. We had to lighten our load for hitchhiking, so we mailed most of our belongings general delivery to Las Vegas. We'd pick them up COD later. Our only purpose for returning to the U.S. was to pull a score big enough to finance a trip to Brazil, where they couldn't extradite us back to the States if they ever caught on to who pulled the clutter deal. We hitchhiked east made it to Iowa where we stole a car parked in a yard. Finally ended up back in Kansas City, my hometown. I started on one of the most cautious check passing sprees that part of the country had ever seen. We were hotter than a pistol because of the checks we'd passed before. I cashed over $500 worth of checks. How I managed to do it without getting busted, I can't imagine. While Agents Nye, Church, and myself were at the Wyandotte County Sheriff's Office, uh, a call came in from the Furniture Mart located at 3206 Brown Avenue in Kansas City that a bogus check had been used the night before to purchase a new Olympic television set. 
went to the furniture mart where employees positively identified Hickok. While we were at the furniture mart, the subject attempted to cash another check at Walt's service station in Kansas City. The son of the station owner recognized Hickok. They had gone to school together. He refused to cash the check, stating that he had a drawer full of them. We cruised the Kansas City area in search for the car or subject with negative results. On December 18th, we interviewed Mrs. Dorothy Marchant, the sister of Perry Edward Smith. Mrs. Marchant told us that she was afraid of Perry Smith and that she had very little to do with him. She considered he was a lot like his father. They both did not respect the rights of others, nor did they care how they lived. Mrs. Marchant told us that when they were young, they suffered severe hardships. My father was a farmer, trapper, and quite a famous bronco rider in rodeos during his younger days. Our family was my brother James, my sister Fern, my sister Dorothy, and myself. My mother was also a country girl and later became a lady champion bronco rider. She was an Indian. Her maiden name was Buckskin. His mom was a rodeo star. The rodeo culture got woven into their life. Perry's dad was Irish, and his mom was full-blood Indian. And I guess that's why he got along with my dad, uh, Joe. They're both half-breeds. At some point, our family moved to Juneau, where my father was making hooch, a bootlegger. I believe it was during this period my mother became acquainted with alcohol. I remember my mother was entertaining some sailors while my father was away. When he came home, my father threw the sailors out after a violent struggle and proceeded to beat my mother. I was scared. Mom ended up taking us kids to San Francisco. She ran off with Dad's truck, leaving him behind in jail where she had him put. In Frisco, I run as free and wild as a coyote. My mother was always drunk, never in a fit condition to properly provide and care for us. There was no rule or discipline or anyone to show me right from wrong. I had stole so many things from so many stores, I lost track of which was first. I was sent away to school. I wet the bed every night. This was very humiliating, but I couldn't control myself. I was severely beaten by the cottage mistress. Back in those days, you wouldn't want to believe that the nuns were so mean, but they were that mean, they were that strict, they were punishing. One evening, she hit me with her flashlight. I still carry the scar on my penis. She almost severed it completely off. She was later discharged, but this never changed my mind about what I wished I could have done to her and all the people who made fun of me. Mrs. Marchant told us that she was afraid of Perry Smith, and in the event that Kansas officers talked to him, she requested that he not be advised of her present address. Mrs. Marchant also told us that she had never lived in Fort Scott, Kansas. That was the alibi that they had come up with. And of course, that was all a ruse. That wasn't true at all. It was agreed that the county would conduct a daily press conference. Uh, I have no comment in regard to that. Handling the news people who were arriving was a matter to deal with. One morning, the sheriff's secretary interrupted my gloom. She ushered in a woman and a short, small man wrapped in a long scarf. Mr. Dewey, I am Truman Capote, and this is my friend, Nell Harper Lee. She's a writer, too. <laughs> Truman had been a famous writer since the 1940s. He had written short stories, which were widely read. And because of his demeanor and his way of doing things, he became uh, rather famous. He was in the newspaper columns, the gossip columns all the time, and not making a whole lot of money, but he became very well known. Then one morning in November 1959, while flicking through the New York Times, I encountered on a deep inside page this headline. Wealthy farmer, three of family, slain. 
I thought about it all that November day and part of the next. The killers had not been caught, but Truman didn't care about them. What he cared about was the effect these killings would have on this little town because he, had, he knew little towns. He'd grown up in a little town, spent much of his life in a little town in the South. He was a little nervous about going to Kansas. Truman looked for someone to go along with him, and he talked to a friend of his. Um, he talked to um, Harper Lee, who had just written a novel called um, To Kill a Mockingbird, but it had not been published. Truman and Harper Lee had been neighbors in Monroeville, Alabama. She was a year younger, but she was sort of the boss. Truman was too soft for the boys, and Nell was too hard for the girls. Uh, she was very assertive. She is a gifted woman, courageous, and with a warmth that instantly kindles most people. Feeling at loose ends, she said she would accompany me in the role of assistant researchers. It was twilight when we arrived. That day was the first time I set eyes on Truman Capote. He said, what I'm here for is to do a very special story on the family. Doesn't make any difference to me if the case is even solved. Well, he could have talked all day without saying that. It made one hell of a difference to me. He was right to be nervous because when he went out there, they looked on Truman as if he had just uh, arrived on a spaceship from Mars. Didn't go very well. They didn't want to divulge details to strangers. So they shut him down. Um, a number of people just turned on their heels and said, I don't want to talk about it. Well, when he came in, he was such a little fellow. I thought, well, who's this little kid coming in? <laughs> but some don't think they should let him in Garden City. Why didn't they keep him out? We were all looking forward to several days at Herbert's this Thanksgiving. Herbert and Bonnie had planned for the Clutter family Thanksgiving dinner to be at their home near Holcomb. We had already received the invitation in the mail before this happened. Dear family, it is time we had a family reunion long enough to really get acquainted again. We were all so excited, and they were so, Herbert was so excited. He's going to have us all out there. Activities will include gabbing, games of all kinds, hunting, horseback riding, after dinner naps, eating, TV football games. So she had it very well organized. <laughs> we will have good bed space for 17 adults and floor space for all the kids and a baby bed available. There had not been a big Thanksgiving gathering since Grandma Clutter died in 1954. And I know it would have been a great time. And boy, did somebody ruin it. Yeah, they had a family reunion just not the way they planned it. Here's something from Truman Capote asking to um, show around the farm. That was the only request they've ever had. Truman asked permission to walk around the house and got permission for Nell and Truman to come on the property and come into the house. There was Capote standing in front of the house and I just felt so angry like he had no business there and it seemed like a real invasion the house seemed haunted all that was missing were the people and the rooms had been of course uh, cleaned after the murder scene but they really had a sense of entering into the inner sanctum that was very disappointing very disappointing I understand people have to make their living, but it's sad that it has to come off of somebody else's tragedy. And I can remember them saying it's time, I wish we just would have torn the house down, because that's not the way you want to remember your home. Do you remember yes. that picture? I know. What year is that? 1950. 1950. I looked pretty good in those days. Too bad time changes things. When I was in the Army, back about the time of the Korean War, I was training, and we had a fellow who joined us, and he was almost finished with his service. We were bunkmates. His name was Perry Edward Smith, and he was an excellent 
equipment operator. He always had a smile on his face, but he never talked about his family. His mother abandoned the family. She died of an alcoholic overdose. The brother committed suicide. The sister, she probably also committed suicide. He did have one sister who was living in California and had a real life. He joined the army, and this was at the time of the height of the Korean War. But he never saw much action. He started drinking heavily and carousing, got into fights. I had many violent bursts of anger. I was in Korea 15 months and finished my army service in Fort Lewis, Washington. Around Christmas time, I decided I was going to take home leave. And I had a very nice leather jacket. And Perry asked me if he could borrow his jacket because he had rented a motorcycle. When I came back, uh, Perry was gone. My jacket was gone. He had slid on some sandy patch and really messed up his legs. Uh, he was lucky that they weren't amputated. They were so bad. I spent about a year in the hospital. Shattered left leg, broken hip, broken left arm. He used to take aspirin two or three at a time, not with water. He would chew them to kill the pain. After my accident, I stayed with a friend till spring. Perry Smith was kind of a unique part of our family. I wasn't even born yet when my parents first met him. I was born Jewel Perry William James, and Perry was my dad's friend, so I was named after him. When I was about five, uh, Perry showed up. Most children have fear of strangers, but even before I seen him, I had this something not right. I closed my eyes, I covered my ears. I wouldn't look at him, I wouldn't listen to him. Something about him scared me. Since I was named after him, I guess I was supposed to be his friend. And so that summer, uh, he had bought a Model A Ford. We all loaded on and picked dandelions out of a field, and Perry and my dad made dandelion wine. And it seemed to me that he was pretty happy with the people here, you know? I think probably if he stayed here, he would have been, he'd probably be alive yet. You know, but uh, he left, you know, and uh, we never heard from him again. We found out later he was uh, in communications with a colleague that was in prison with him. Both of them ended up in the same prison and developed some type of a friendship. During that friendship, Dick Hickok had come up with a plan that he was going to rob the Clutter family of their money and that he wasn't going to leave any witnesses but he didn't have um, the nerve himself to carry it out. And that's why he had enlisted the help of Perry Smith. Perry had told Hickok that prior to 1955, he had killed a black man by clubbing him to death. It's possible that uh, this story was developed to make him look a little bit tougher so people would leave him alone in prison, and Dick Hickok believed the story. Dick thought that he would be a good accomplice because in case they needed to kill someone, he knew Perry would do it, and he wouldn't have to do that. They both very much were dreamers that had started in that period when they were incarcerated. They had been feeding each other's fantasies. It was going to be this big score, and then they was going to head to Mexico and start a new life. He connected with Perry Smith, and the two together were a fatal combination. There are three things that Dick often said after leaving prison. He said that he was going to get a big score, that his family would have no more money worries. And he said, there will be no witnesses. After the check spree in Kansas, we drove on to Florida. Got to Miami Beach on the 21st and spent Christmas there. Everything we got with the checks was sold in Florida for about a fourth of what I'd paid for it. On the 26th, we left Miami and drove all over creation. 
Went to Jacksonville where I'd worked half a day digging a ditch. Been to South Carolina, New Orleans, Shreveport, Dallas, and Fort Worth. In Fort Worth, we picked up a hitchhiker and his son and drove them home to Corpus. We picked up $2 worth of soda bottles on the side of the road on the way there. Then we went to El Paso, then to Phoenix, where we slept in the car. And finally, just before New Year's, we decided we'd head back to Vegas. By Christmas Day, we had been working on the Wells lead for almost three weeks, but it wasn't gelling. Smith and Hickok were out there somewhere, and we weren't finding them. It wasn't the best Christmas we ever had at our house. Our boys were 9 and 12, but I didn't have much enthusiasm for fooling with their toys. Mom was, in many respects, a single parent much of the time. Doing this investigation, Dad was gone a lot. And uh, I always felt that she gave up a lot for him. It was just a, a very lonely time. Hard to sleep at night. Always looking out if there was somebody who was gonna come after me also. I really don't know how to explain what a person at that age, how it would affect them. I know it was a very lonely, very lonely time. I don't remember being depressed until Nancy and Kenyon were killed. Even worse than the grief was the chaos that entered my mind and my spirit. There was no longer any point in planning. No reason to expect fairness or justice. No reason to expect anything good just because you worked hard and were good to others. I don't know exactly when I stopped going to church. I raged at God for a while, raged at him for letting that happen when they had done nothing to deserve it. What kind of God would let something that terrible happen? If that was what God was like, well, I could do without him. At Christmas, there was no big gathering at my parents' home. I, I began distancing myself from them. It had become the only way I could manage the pain I felt for them. My pitiful parents, conscientious, law-abiding citizens, shocked that their son was a wanted man. My first wife and I did manage to share our presents with my children. As they sat with the lights flickering on our Christmas tree, I, I decided to tell them that Uncle Dick had done something wrong. As I struggled to find the words, I looked at their young and innocent faces and wondered how hard it's going to be for them to be Hickoks in the state of Kansas. I came to know so many people there that I wouldn't have known under any other circumstance in my life and came to like them a great deal and made many, many friends there. Truman started off on hugely the wrong foot, but they eventually became friends. Once Harper and uh, Truman became friends with the Deweys, Truman was uh, up on the investigation. As a result of perseverance, Nell Harper Lee and Truman Capote were well into Al Dewey's graces. He trusted them, he liked them. They were invited over to the Deweys to have dinner, during which a critical phone call came. Law enforcement in Las Vegas had received an attempt to locate from Kansas for these two subjects, Smith and Hickok. And they were given a vehicle description and tag number. It was early evening when two local officers on patrol happened to spot a black 1956 Chevy outside the post office with plates that matched the dispatch from Kansas. Smith and Hickok had just stopped and picked up the belongings that they had shipped from Mexico uh, to Las Vegas. Officers searched the car and in the trunk found a box from Mexico. That evening, Truman and Nell were having dinner with us. A phone call came from Las Vegas where Dad is informed that Hickok and Smith had been caught. 
Las Vegas Police Department said Happy New Year and Merry Christmas and everything else, we've got these two guys in custody. Al was in a celebratory mood. They had him. Got out a big map, put it on the dining room table, and showed the route that they would take out there to Las Vegas. And Truman wanted to go out to Las Vegas with Al Dewey to, to uh, bring them back. But Al said, not this time. Not this time. I asked the officer on the phone if they'd found anything, like boots. He said, yes. Turns out the box they found in the trunk contained two. One with a cat's paw sole design and the other with a diamond tread. Both were similar to the tracks found on the cardboard box at the murder scene. They sent those boots and other materials to General Delivery Las Vegas, Perry Smith. Thank God they did that. If the Las Vegas police had grabbed them earlier, that really critical piece of evidence wouldn't have been found. It was purely happenstance. Purely happenstance. It was at that point that I told them to keep the men in maximum security until we arrived. around the end of December of 1959, and Smith and Hickok were arrested in Las Vegas, Nevada. Here we have mug shots of both Smith and Hickok, Hickok on the left and Perry Smith on the right. And then uh, there's a picture of the bloody boot print that law enforcement took. Uh, and, and the boot here is one of Perry Smith's boots that he wore on the night that the clutters were murdered. Those boots, well, you count on good luck falling your way sometimes, and, and that's from what happened in the clutter case. One of the strategies, if you have multiple defendants, is uh, identifying the person that's most likely to uh, engage in a conversation. And by golly, that had to be Hickok. Exactly. Yeah. Hickok's personality was he thought he could do a snow job, basically. He felt more comfortable trying to engage conversation to learn more about what the agents knew. I first saw Dick Hickok in jail inside the Las Vegas Police Department. Agent Church and myself took him to the interrogation room. They go into the evening, first day as I recall, and Hickok, of course, is his usual boastful braggadocio cell but that evening Nye and Church kind of play with uh, Hickok we started off by going over these checks that he had passed in the Kansas City area what was obtained through these checks where it was disposed of and then we go into his particular activities along with Perry Edward Smith over the weekend of the 14th and 15th of November, 1959. We asked him about the murderer of the Clutter family in Holcomb, Kansas. To help him get the confessions, they had to have um, evidence available to him uh, to show that listen, we got you guys, so it'd be in your best interest to talk to us. Um, and one of the things that they talked about was the boot print. You know, we have your boots. Is there any reason why your boot print should be at the scene if you've never been there before? You understand that this can be used against you? Yes. Well, now, here's the thing, you know, something like this. Is there any way I can get out on a manslaughter charge? Because I never pulled the trigger. In fact, I didn't even know what the goddamn hell was going on. I was in the other room when it first happened. 
course, that'll have to be worked out with the county attorney, Dick. I couldn't tell you that. Well, I'm not even a confession, you know. This is the true picture of what happened out there. This is your story of what happened out there. You do whatever you want. That's just a suggestion. Well, this, what's the name of this family out there? Herbert Carter. Herbert Carter. On the other side, Smith was not really giving up anything. Mm. Uh, he was very cagey. Don't discuss anything. Less information out there, the better off I am. Definitely more adept at avoiding answering questions uh, in a criminal setting than Hickok. I first talked to Perry Smith on January 2nd, 1960. This is at the police department at Las Vegas. I talked to him from 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He denied any knowledge of the clutter murders. At that time, of course, Hickok was giving a basically a full confession. Who was with you? Perry Smith. But there wasn't to be any killing. That's pretty damn sure. Quite a little speed on no time. He'll probably deny shooting. How are you going to prove the difference? Well, you know it's a trick anyhow. Do you have get the road if you don't? Charges in the slaying of the Herbert Clutter family in Holcomb were filed after a dramatic confession was made in Las Vegas by Kansas State Penitentiary parolee Richard Eugene Hickok, aged 28, who was charged with four counts of murder. Hickok made his statement then collapsed into the arms of lawmen. The confession also implicated parolee Perry Edward Smith. Smith, questioned separately, declined to confirm that he participated in the slayings. Both men will be returned.
this week. They took two vehicles and each uh, suspect was transported separately. And that's just strategy. So, you know, one can't learn from the other as to what's going on. Hickok and Mr. Church were in the lead car. Myself, Perry, and Mr. Dunce were following. Before we were even out of the city limits, I told Perry Smith that Hickok had given other agents a statement. Perry could see Hickok in the car ahead. And Hickok was talking. Perry Smith had taken offense to what was told law enforcement by Hickok. Perry said to us, isn't he tough? Look at him talk. Then he said, Hickok had told me if we were ever caught that we weren't going to say a word. But there he is, just talking his head off. Perry Smith, you know, was on the trip home when he started discussing the actual case uh, with Agent Dewey. With a sudden burst of anger, he said, now I'm going to tell you what happened. The meltdown starts. <laughs> I got this letter from Dick while I was in Buell, Idaho. He said he had what he called some setup that was a cinch. I never would have left if it hadn't been for this so-called invitation from Dick to come down to Kansas City. Smith said he came to Kansas City by bus from Las Vegas on November 11th. Dick met me in the bus station. He told me all about this cinch. Smith said that he stayed overnight on November 13th at the home of Dick's parents in the small town of Edgerton. Next morning, they had put new tires on Hickok's car, and shortly after lunch, they left Olathe for Holcomb. We had Dick's shotgun and a hunting jacket full of shells and extra shells. All this in the trunk of the car. We bought some cord in Empora. In the store, Dick asked how much we would need. I told him, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. And Dick said to the clerk, well, hell, give it all to us. Smith said it was enough to tie up 12 to 14 people. It was before midnight when they pulled into a service station inside the Garden City limits. From there, it was a short stretch to Holcomb. It was discussed if we was ever been seen or identified. Dick said then that member of the family had to go. I asked Perry what he meant by the word go. He said he meant to kill them. very envious i am very envious of their ability to get the confessions from the two suspects but it would be equivalent of winning an 80 million dollar lottery i agree i think just the feeling to know pretty much assured in your mind that you've got the people that's responsible would have been very rewarding but the case is not over yet you haven't yet convicted the guilty, lying, thieving, SOB, but that will come.
East Coast, now I'm in the East Coast. Saw you when I